As you begin to learn about organic chemistry, you'll see that many organic compounds can be very large and complicated. Because of this, we'll need to find ways that we can communicate about the particular organic compounds that we're talking about. In a later video, we'll learn how to name the different organic structures that we'll be talking about. But in this video, we want to introduce some of the ways we can write about the organic compounds that we're learning. In previous courses, you've learned about molecular formulas. These are ways of communicating the number of atoms of each kind that are present in a compound. For example, we can write the molecular formula for an organic structure as C4H10, indicating that there are four carbons and 10 hydrogens. However, when we have organic structures, we'll see that the molecular formula is not really enough to tell us everything we need to know. For example, if we drew Lewis structures or structural formulas for compounds with a formula C4H10, you could imagine that we could draw two different Lewis structures. In the first one, which we would call a straight chain structure, we see that the carbons are connected in a chain of four carbons and the hydrogens are connected to the carbons so that each carbon has four bonds. In what we would call a branched chain Lewis structure, the carbon in the middle, the second carbon, has three carbons attached to it. We see in each case that these structures both have four carbons and 10 hydrogens. However, there are differences. These kinds of structures that have the same molecular formula, but the atoms are attached in different ways, are called structural isomers. On the previous slide, you learned about Lewis structures. These structural formulas are useful for showing how the connectivity of the molecules can be different, even though they have the same molecular formulas. However, organic compounds can be very large. When we have large organic compounds, Lewis structures or structural formulas can take a long time to write. Because of this, chemists have developed a shorthand way of drawing structural formulas. These are called condensed structural formulas. Condensed structural formulas focus on the connectivity of CH units in the formulas. The reason for this is that the carbons tend to have a characteristic number of hydrogens and these carbon hydrogen units are generally not very reactive and so they're generally stable units. When we want to draw a condensed structural formula, we simply take the Lewis structure or structural formula and identify the carbon hydrogen units. For example, in the straight chain C4H10, we see that the carbon all the way to the left has one carbon with three hydrogens. In a condensed structural formula, this would be written as CH3. The second and third carbons in the straight chain unit each have only two hydrogens attached to them, so each of these would be a CH2 unit. The fourth carbon, all the way on the right, also has three hydrogens, so we would represent this in a condensed structural formula as CH3. We could do a similar condensed structural formula for the branched chain C4H10 structural isomer. The difference is that the second carbon in the line of three is a CH, and we draw a line down to a separate CH3 unit. You should be able to see that drawing condensed structural formulas allows us to indicate the connectivity of the CH units much more quickly than would a structural formula that shows all of the carbon and hydrogen bonds. Sometimes even drawing a condensed structural formula can be a little bit tedious, and chemists tend to be slightly lazy anyway. Due to this, chemists have developed a shorthand way of drawing structural formulas. These are known as bond line or skeletal structures. Skeletal structures only show the bonds between carbons, but they do not show the bonds between carbons and hydrogens. It's understood that a carbon will have four bonds. So if we see a carbon with one line leaving from it, 
that indicates that that carbon is bonded to one other carbon. And what we're not seeing, what's understood, is that that carbon will have three bonds to hydrogens. A skeletal structure will look something like this. When we look at a skeletal structure, it's important to remember that at the end of each line is a carbon. So this line has a carbon at one end and a carbon at the other. This middle line has a carbon at one end and the other. And this third line has a carbon at one end and the other. Since there are three lines, that means that there are one, two, three, four carbons. Once we know how many carbons there are, we can also determine how many hydrogens are attached to each carbon, as long as we remember that each carbon has to have four bonds. This first carbon, since it has one bond drawn to another carbon, it must have three invisible bonds to hydrogens. So we know that this carbon represents a CH3 unit. The second carbon has two lines coming from it, which means it has two bonds to other carbons. What we're not seeing are the two bonds to the two hydrogens to give it a total of four bonds. That means that this second carbon must represent a CH2 unit. The same kind of analysis can be done for this third carbon. It, we see two bonds, so there must be two hydrogens that are being ignored. The final carbon has only one bond, just like the first carbon, so this final carbon must also represent a CH3 unit. When we compare this three-line structure to the carbon-hydrogen units, we see that really this is just the skeletal structure for the straight chain C4H10 unit that we've seen on previous slides. What would the structural isomer for C4H10 look like in a bond line formula? In that case, we had a CH3 connected to CH, connected to a CH3, and connected to a CH3. That means that we have three lines that all connect to a central carbon. The bond line formula would look something like this. When we look at this bond line formula, we see that the central carbon has three lines to it. That means that there's three carbons bonded to the central carbon, which means the central carbon must only have one bond available for a hydrogen. So this carbon in the middle must represent a CH unit, as we see in the condensed structural formula. Each of the other three carbons on the ends of the lines is only connected to the central carbon, and so there must be three hydrogens on each of these outer carbons. And so each of these outer carbons would represent a CH3 unit, as we see with the condensed structural formula.